Hi, everybody. Welcome to this night's uh, webinar. We'll be starting shortly. Hi, everyone. I'm going to start sharing my screen, and the videos should be on the side. So. Just a few more minutes and we'll get started. I see people uh, signing on to the webinar. Um, if you wanna put in the chat where you are from, um, we can uh, read those out. I've got Northern Virginia. We've got Ontario, Canada. Welcome, Canada. Oh, Gracie. Hi, Grace. Hi, Grace. <laughs> I just, I just saw, hi, Grace. <laughs> Ooh. Grace, your picture is very beautiful as I'm looking at it. And so is yours, Monique. Hey, Monique. We're still coming in. I'll just have to wait another minute or yep. two before we start. We've got um, hello from Overland Park, Kansas. We've got oh, I'm gonna British Columbia. Um, and we've got Vancouver Island, and I, it's I'm gonna chop up the name N A N A I M O, British Columbia on Vancouver Island. <laughs> Nanamo. Michelle, I know that you're going to be part of my Canadian Zoom, so you're going to have to tell me how to pronounce that. <laughs> Welcome. All right, why don't we get started? So uh, to start off, I'd like to just introduce myself. I'm Josephine Grima. I'm the Chief Science Officer for the Marfan Foundation. I'd like to also introduce you to my colleague, Helene Baruch, who is our co-moderator and looking at the chat, she'll be posting different links um, and information in there for you. Hi, everybody. So welcome to week two of the uh, International E3 Summit, educating, empowering, and enriching our community. It's being brought to you by the Marfan Foundation and its divisions, the Lois Dietz Syndrome Foundation, the VEDS movement, and uh, our partners at, in Europe, VASCERN. So we want to thank you for making this summit truly historic. It's by far the foundation's largest event. We have nearly 2,700 reg uh, registrants and uh, more, from more than 70 countries. So uh, not only are you from all over the world, um, we have so many different conditions represented here, um, over about 1,600 with Marfan syndrome, uh, almost 500 with Lois Dietz, 140 with vascular Ehlers-Danlos, and many different others. We even have um, over 300 uh, medical professionals that have been uh, listening to some of these webinars. So we really like to thank our presenting sponsors, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital and the American Communication Construction Company. So before we uh, start this presentation, um, I just want to, uh, to note that the International E3 Summit is a forum to provide an open discussion of issues related to genetic, aortic and vascular conditions. Opinions stated in each of these talks are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of the Marfan Foundation or Vasern. Uh, 
If questions arise or clarifications are needed about differences uh, between session speakers, please contact us at marfan.org slash E3ask. So before we start the presentation, um, I wanted to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have a patient perspective tonight, and I'd like uh, to give Bill Barnhart a opportunity just to say hello to everybody. Good evening. We also have a very new member of our professional advisory board uh, from Northwestern University, uh, Dr. Chris Malazari. And we have Dr. Morel Uzmu. <laughs> I knew I was going to mess that up. That's okay, Joe. Uzunian. Morel, it's fine. Morel Uzunian. Um, and if you want to say a few words too to the, to the crowd. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. So we're going to start the presentations. I'm going to turn off the or, uh, the videos and the audio so that we can hear the uh, pre-recorded presentations. Hi there, my name's Bill Barnhart. I'm 46 years old. I've been a Marfan patient since I was three. Well, I've been a Marfan patient my whole life. I was diagnosed when I was three years old. Uh, luckily, because of a, a keen-eyed optometrist was able to notice the subluxated lenses that are so common in Marfan patients and recommended me to Johns Hopkins hospital where I was able to work with the fantastic team there, diagnosed me and start following my treatment over the years. Uh, I've had, was relatively incident free until 2002. I was 30 years old, or just before I turned 30 years old, I had a aortic dissection. Uh, it was, I was at work and the best we've been able to figure the contributing factors were a lot of stress. I probably wasn't taking as good a care of myself as I should have. And I was drinking a lot of energy drinks. Um, that's one thing I would definitely tend to stay away from, try to stay away from. Uh, the weekend before my dissection, I'd been camping with a bunch of people and energy drinks were flowing like crazy. Um, but I had my dissection, ended up in uh, not going into surgery right away. And they actually let the scar tissue heal over so that it would provide a stronger bond for the uh, aorta for a short time period and was having frequent CAT scans and able to monitor it. It was a couple years later in 2007 that I ended up getting the phone call of my aorta, aorta had expanded to the point of needing to be repaired. So luckily my first surgery was a big one. It was a triple A um, and they did the, what I call the shark bite scar that went around most of my side and across my belly. Um, and it went very well. It was a great team doing it and I was able to be well prepared, which prepared me for my second aortic surgery, which was two years later, they replaced my valve and uh, aortic root. Um, this was done at a different hospital, a different team, but still did an amazing job. Um, I, I had opted for the mechanical valve this time, and it was going great till a few years later through a uh, series of events, actually some uh, difficulties from another surgery, I ended up with endocarditis, which was in the, uh, attached to the mechanical valve 
and the aortic graft. Um, that was 2014. We did a relatively emergency surgery. It was uh, planned a day before where they replaced the valve again and uh, replaced the root with a new graft. This time it was a cadaver valve was inserted and a pacemaker, um, which has been no issues at all. The, uh, a year later, I had the, my aorta replaced from my renal arteries down into my legs to the iliacs with a 14-hour surgery that also repaired a number of hernia issues uh, that had caught, been caused from both Marfan syndrome and the previous abdominal surgeries. Um, that was planned, went extremely well for a long surgery, long procedure, uh, and everything has really been in great shape up until 2019 when I dissected again. Ironically, on the anniversary of the same day my first dissection was, but 16 years later, um, the uh, this surgery, they were able to repair the aorta during a transarterial procedure. So they did not need to go through my chest. They did not need to give me another zipper with it. I do know that that's a possibility in the future. Um, but this was a emergency repair that went really, really well. The a couple things that I've been able to take away from it the whole time is I've been lucky enough to have both the planned surgeries and the unplanned emergency surgeries. Knowing that you're never really sure what's going to happen, I try to keep my attitude up. I try to keep a positive outlook on it because you have to enjoy it life as much as you can. There's a lot of precautions you still have to take and you have to be careful to know your limitations. And don't be, uh, my attitude is to not be held down by the fact that something could happen because frankly you get hit by a bus walking off the, stepping off a street corner. But to enjoy the opportunities that you do have. Um, I've been able to lead a full life and plan to continue to live a full life for many years to come uh, with Marfan syndrome. With, I have become a big advocate for the patients and for learning a lot about it. We've been very lucky to grow up in an era where you can educate yourself a lot about Marfan's and other connective tissue disorders where doctors and medicine is advancing every day with technology and knowledge that 30 years ago, we wouldn't be able to do these procedures as easily. My last surgery, I was out of the hospital in four days. It was fantastic. Um, so those are kind of my big takeaways from it that you wanna make sure that you're really knowing your limitations, taking care of yourself, but also enjoying and keeping as positive as you can. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Malasery. I'm professor of surgery in the Division of Cardiac Surgery and attending cardiac surgeon at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in downtown Chicago, Illinois. I'm most proud to be serving the Marfan community as a part of the professional advisory board for the Marfan Foundation. And today I'll be talking about an update on cardiac surgery for Marfan patients. I've been at Northwestern for 13 years. And over the past uh, decade or so, we've been very proud to have hosted the Marfan Foundation Family Conference twice. The first time was in 2012. And that was a special time for us because it marked the uh, beginning of the new children's hospital, um, now called the Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. 
And we had our second conference in 2015, and that's when the foundation changed its name to the Marfan Foundation. We're looking forward to be hosting the annual conference again in Chicago next year, on July 8th uh, through 11th. So please uh, join us at that time. We would welcome you very, um, very warmly. The objectives of this talk are gonna be three. The first is I'm going to explain why prevention is so important for patients with aortic aneurysms. The second thing I will do is explain what happens during surgery for the aortic catastrophe called aortic dissection. And finally, I'll end with some frequently asked questions about cardiac surgery for Marfan syndrome. Starting with prophylactic aortic root surgery, this is a figure of a normal aorta on the left, and you can see the coronary arteries arising from the aortic root, and the aorta itself is normal size. On the right, on the B panel, is an abnormal aortic root, and it is severely dilated, uh, which you can see, and it's centered not only the ascending aorta, but also centered on the aortic root um, abutting the aortic valve. Surgery for the aortic root aneurysm um, can be performed in two ways. The first way is via a valve replacing strategy, and the second is via a valve sparing uh, procedure. The valve replacement carries the moniker of the Bentall procedure, named after Hugh Bentall. And the valve sparing procedure can be done by either one of two techniques named after Tyrone David, the David procedure, and Dr. Magdi Yacoub, the Yacoub procedure. Starting with the Bentall procedure, the Bentall procedure resects the aortic aneurysm as well as the aortic valve, and therefore requires a valved conduit. Some people call that also a composite valve graft. And the diagram shows there a mechanical valve. It's part of a valved conduit, which is sewn on the bottom of a Dacron graft. And this is typically what our Marfan patients would receive with a Bentall procedure, because most of our Marfan patients are younger patients and look for a long life expectancy and therefore the most durable valve possible. However, the valve conduit can also be constructed of a tissue valve, which is shown here on the right, otherwise known as a bioprosthetic valve. And we reserve the bioprosthetic valves for patients of older age, so 50 years or older. Um, so the Bentall procedure can be done by a valved conduit, either mechanical or a tissue valve. The valve sparing aortic root replacement, on the other hand, uh, specifically, the David procedure uh, requires only a Dacron graft. The aortic valve is spared or repaired in this procedure. So the first panel A, you can see a heart with an aorta, and the aorta has a large aortic root aneurysm. In panel B, we have resected that aortic root aneurysm. In panel C, the aortic valve is re-implanted within the Dacron graft, so it is spared and repaired if needed. And the final product, D, is shown there with a Dacron graft, which has completely replaced the aorta, which is abnormal, with the aortic valve, which is re-implanted inside. I'll play a little bit of this surgical procedure showing the David procedure. And here we could see that the aortic valve is deconstructed from the aortic root. You can see the three leaflets of the uh, aortic valve. Um, here we're preparing the aortic valve to be re-implanted within this Dacron graft. Dacron graft is a polyester weave which is constructed in a machine to form a perfect tube. Now this tube of Dacron is then um, um, moved parachuted down on the um, aortic uh, annulus, which forms the base of the heart. And here we are putting the aortic valve within the Dacron graft. So the valve now lives within that Dacron graft. After quite a bit of sewing, you can see the valve works 
perfectly normally within this Dacron graft, and we hope that it will live um, in there for a very long time with a good durability. The decision making for when to replace the aneurysm is very important. In most experts, recommend that aneurysms be replaced when the size uh, reaches or exceeds 5.0 centimeters. And uh, that is taking into account the risk of surgery as well as the risk of simply leaving the aneurysm alone. And the reason we like to get the aneurysm when it's five centimeters is because the risk of an aortic catastrophe suddenly jumps at six centimeters. So if you look at the panel that says rupture, dissection, or death, all very bad things, that that risk is stable at 3.5 to 3.9 centimeters yellow, 4.0 to 4.9 green, 5.0 to 5.9 purple, but jumps suddenly to a very high number, 15% at six centimeters. Now we can do an elective aortic repair at a very low risk of death. And this is a uh, series from Johns Hopkins, um, Vincent Gott series, that's a series that was published almost uh, 1999, very large series. And he had a very good record of success with elective repair, 1.5% risk of death with this repair. So it's very, very good. Now for the valve sparing aortic root replacement, uh, the valve sparing is not quite as durable as the Bentall procedure with the mechanical valve. And this is a study that was uh, sponsored by the Marfan Foundation. And it showed that the Bentall procedure had pretty much 99 to 100% durability at one year compared to about 93% for the valve sparing procedure. However, what I think is most important is that survival is better after a valve sparing aortic root replacement. Uh, Northwestern, I've been following our series of valve sparing aortic root replacements over the past decade plus. And in 2019, I've only um, recorded one person who has died in our series of over 151 patients of valve sparing surgeries. And this is compared to patients who undergo a Bentall procedure. And we think that this differential in survival has to do with the fact that the patient with the Bentall procedure has an artificial valve that they have to contend with, with the Coumadin for mechanical valve and risk of reoperation that can be associated with a tissue valve. Now, what happens in surgery for an acute type A aortic dissection? Well, the dissection all starts with a tear. And here um, you can see that a tear in the inner lining of the aorta, the intima, leads to blood flowing into a false passage, which can further extend both ways proximally and distally. Now, this tear causes a false passage that can be deadly. And you can see that the entry tear in the intima leads to the false lumen, which can cause a rupture. That's one deadly catastrophe. A heart attack, that's denoted as myocardial infarction here in this figure, and a stroke. And these um, aren't the only catastrophes that can hope happen with a dissection, but these are the most deadly. Now, surgery for acute aortic dissection is life-saving, but is still very risky. And going back to Dr. Gott's series from Johns Hopkins, in an emergency repair for Marfan aortic dissection is associated with a much higher risk of death, 11.7% risk of death if we had to do um, surgery for an aortic dissection. So this is an important thing to remember. And even after a successful repair, and I want our um, members to know this, that even after a successful repair, that there is a residual disease of the aorta. And this diagram shows what is typically done for an aortic dissection repair, which is replacement of the ascending aorta. 
What people don't know is that this operation will leave an unrepaired aortic root, which can further dilate and require surgery later. And it also leaves a chronic dissection in the descending aorta, which we call the type B aortic dissection. So it is, it is common for me to see Marfan patients after an aortic dissection that will require a series of future operations after the type A dissection repair. So to recap what I've talked about, about surgery for aneurysm versus surgery for dissection, uh, we must remember that the aneurysm repair is an elective operation, meaning that you come to clinic and we can decide when to perform the aneurysm surgery in a very controlled fashion. The dissection repair, however, is an emergency. You present to the emergency room and you are rushed uh, within an hour to two to the operating room for a life-saving surgery. Another important difference is that for the aneurysm surgery, it is very likely, especially if you come to a center of excellence, that you can be offered a valve sparing procedure, a David procedure. However, in an aortic dissection, it is unlikely that you'll get a valve sparing procedure unless you end up in the same center of excellence. Again, I will highlight the operative risk for aneurysm repair runs in the range of one to 2% for an elective aneurysm repair. But if you present with a dissection, that can range from 10 to 20% risk of death, even after successful repair. And finally, uh, we have to remember that for an elective aneurysm repair, there is no residual disease left. And many of our patients can have the elective aneurysm the root repaired and never have to have another operation again. And this is contrasted to patients who have surgery for an aortic dissection where they're left with residual disease in the aorta and they may be subject to future operations in the future. Now I'll end with some frequently asked questions. The first question I often get is what uh, if I have mitral regurgitation in addition to the aortic root aneurysm? Well, the answer to this is you should have your mitral valve repaired at the same time. And uh, these mitral valves can be a little complex. They are billowing valves, um, common valves that we encounter in mitral valve surgery. And here is the operative exposure for a mitral valve repair. And the leaflets are very large, they're redundant, and require resection and reconstruction of the mitral valve leaflets. The final product is seen here. We're testing the mitral valve and there is no leakiness. Um, the redundant segments have been, re have been resected and a ring has been placed to stabilize the mitral valve repair. And there is the echocardiogram, which is, shows no further mitral regurgitation. The second question I often get is, can cardiac surgery be done minimally invasive? And this is a maybe. Uh, mitral valve surgery, I think, is the best option um, for uh, patients. And uh, these are operations that can be done very well with a minimal invasive approach. So that is the most rightward panel you see there. The incision here for this lady is below the breast to the side, so it's not a sternotomy and uh, can accomplish a very good mitral valve repair through this incision. For aortic valve, however, um, aortic valve isolated surgery uh, can be performed through a minimally invasive approach, either between the ribs on the right, as you see on the left panel for this gentleman, in between the ribs, or a very short sternotomy you can see in the middle panel. However, we must remember that isolated aortic valve surgery is uncommon for Marfan patients who need the whole root replaced. So for root replacement, I personally do not perform a minimally invasive cardiac surgery approach. Uh, my root replacements will be done through a full sternotomy. And the final question I get is, can I have a transcatheter heart valve? for my root replacements and valve problem? And the answer for this is no. Um, the TAVR procedure is a revolutionary procedure, but for patients with aortic stenosis. So here you're in this diagram, you can see that the aortic valve is very calcified and tight. 
This is not what is typical for Marfan patients who have either a normal aortic valve or a leaky aortic valve. These TAVR valves are designed for aortic stenosis only, and only in emergency situations do we ever perform TAVR for aortic regurgitation. So this is not an option for uh, our Marfan patients. So to close out this talk, I think these are the three take-home points. The first is that repair of an aortic root aneurysm for Marfan patients can prevent future aortic catastrophe, rupture, and dissection. I think number two, valve sparing aortic root replacements avoids the need for an artificial valve. And this is the procedure that our center would recommend for patients with Marfan patients. However, the Bentall procedure is also a very good and durable procedure for aortic root aneurysm patients. And finally, surgery for aortic dissection is a life-saving procedure, an emergency procedure, but even after successful dissection repair, uh, the patient is left with a residual disease, which may be subject to future operations. Thank you for your attention. My name is Chris Malasery, and I'll turn the microphone back over to um, our hosts. It is a pleasure to be with you here this evening, and I wanted to congratulate and thank the organizers of the E3 Summit for bringing us together in this challenging time. Over the next 15 minutes or so, I will be focusing on surgery for the distal part of the aorta, namely the arch and thoracoabdominal aorta. We will speak about how disease occurs here, how to diagnose it, when and why to operate, and a bit about how we approach surgery for this part of the aorta. We'll start with a brief reminder that the aorta can be broken up into sections, starting at the root or the part of the aorta that's attached to the aortic valve where the coronary arteries come off, where we just heard from Dr. Malazri about how to approach uh, surgery for this portion of the aorta. Um, the arch is the portion of the aorta that has branches that supply blood to the brain and the arms. And after the aorta turns the corner, we encounter the thoracoabdominal aorta, which includes both the descending thoracic aorta, thoracic meaning in the chest, and then below the diaphragm, the abdominal aorta that gives blood supply to the bowel and kidneys and eventually the legs. So who develops distal aortic disease? Well, there's really two main scenarios where we encounter patients who need operations on the arch and thoracoabdominal aorta. And most of the time they have had dissection before. So scenario one is somebody who had a previous type A dissection where the root and the ascending were repaired and then the arch and thoracoabdominal aorta dilate. And scenario two is somebody who has a de novo, a new uh, type B dissection. These are unfortunately somewhat unpredictable and often occur in normal diameter aortas. Um, but an important point is that arch and thoracoabdominal aneurysms are really rare in patients with genetic aortic disorders without preceding dissection. So we either have a type A dissection or a DeBakey type 1 where the first portion of the aorta is repaired and then the arch or thoracoabdominal aorta dilate, or we have a type B dissection and either the thoracic or abdominal or both thoraco the entire thoracoabdominal aorta dilate. And so in the words of one of the pioneers of um, aortic surgery, Stanley Crawford, no patient should be considered cured of the disease, reminding us that lifelong monitoring of the entire aorta is absolutely crucial. So you may be wondering, how do we diagnose problems with the distal aorta? Well, the answer is really quite simple. We need either CT or MRI to image the entire aorta from the root through the arch and the entire thoracoabdominal aorta. And this is one of the most important take home messages uh, from this talk, which is that for those of us who have had an aortic dissection or have a gene genetic aortic disorder, such as Marfan or Lois Deed syndrome or other familial aortopathy, we need lifelong imaging of the entire aorta. Echo is just not enough. Uh, echo is very good to visualize the root and the valve and look at heart function, um, but it cannot look at the arch or the thoracoabdominal aorta. 
And so when and why do we repair the distal aorta? So here are some of the surgical thresholds that we use in Marfan syndrome. And you will notice that as we move from the root and the ascending aorta, to the arch and the distal aorta, the descending and thoracoabdominal aorta, you notice that the numbers get bigger. And that's primarily because the risk of complications increases with these types of operations. Although we, although we sometimes, uh, we do operate at lower sizes for uh, low esteet syndrome and in other certain situations, um, really for each patient, the exact number depends on a whole slew of other factors. And so when we do elective root operations, for example, these can be done with very low risk, less than 1% risk of death or stroke in the elective setting. For an arch repair though, when we have to repair the entire arch and the blood vessels to the brain and the arms are involved, the risk of death or stroke is in the 5% range. And for the thoracoabdominal aorta, the, death of ri the risk of death or major complications is in the 10% range. So as we move down the aorta, the risk of the surgery increases. And so the size at which we offer elective surgery also increases. So size matters, but size really isn't everything. And for every patient, we really stress that it's a personalized decision-making that's uh, very important for all aortic operations. And in addition to the absolute size of the aorta, we consider a whole slew of other factors, including the size of the patient and age of the patient, the specific gene or variant involved, a family history of aortic catastrophe, and most importantly, the life expectancy of the patient and the risk of the proposed intervention have to be uh, considered. And so for every patient, the risk of rupture or dissection have to be balanced against the risk of surgery. And I often remind patients that the primary objective for aortic surgery is the prevention of death. Patients often ask if they will feel better after they've had their arch or their thoracoabdominal aorta repaired. However, these aneurysms very rarely cause symptoms. And so we really do not make people feel better with these operations, but the goal is to make our patients live longer. This is really an important consideration as for some patients who are very elderly or who have another life-threatening terminal illness, the risk of surgery may really not be worth the expected benefit. So how do we repair the distal aorta? So for arch replacement, there are various ways to deal with the head and neck vessels. Um, and for patients with uh, genetic aortic disorders, we prefer this technique in the uh, third panel where each of the arch vessels are reimplanted individually rather than the island in the middle over here that, that you can see that leaves residual aorta around the blood vessels that can then become aneurysmal later. We prefer this technique on the right. And if um, a patient has uh, aortic disease more distally in the thoracic or thoracoabdominal aorta, we often leave what's called an elephant chunk, a soft piece of Dacron in the distal part of the aorta that will facilitate uh, later repair if needed. And surgical techniques have, uh, for the arch have improved uh, tremendously, and we are much better able to protect the brain, the heart, and the spinal cord uh, during these operations. Another technique for patients with aneurysms of the arch and the first part of the descending thoracic aorta is called a total arch replacement with a frozen elephant trunk. The frozen referring to the a stent, a stented portion of the, uh, that sits in the descending thoracic aorta that you can see in this uh, picture. Um, these hybrid arch grafts uh, may be helpful in letting us repair more of the aorta from a sternotomy in a single setting, um, and they may also delay surgery in the uh, distal part of the aorta, the thoracic or thoracoabdominal aorta. Um, the use of these grafts in patients with genetic disorders is uncertain, although because the stent is actually sewn mechanically onto Dacron proximally, uh, this may in fact uh, be a viable option for us. And then uh, moving on to the lower part of the aorta, um, this is a diagram illustrating how we fix the thoracoabdominal aorta that goes from the thoracic aorta and involves the abdominal aorta. And you can see the principle is the same here as in the arch where the individual branches, we prefer individual branches to the uh, blood vessels that supply the kidney and the bowels with blood rather than constructing these as a patch. We prefer to do individual uh, bypasses 
cases in patients who have genetic aortic disorders. And you can see here that the aorta that we play, that we replace has very important blood supply all along its course to the spinal cord. This is an intercostal patch that's been re-implanted to supply blood uh, to the spinal cord. But the, um, the fact that we're removing the native aorta and replacing it with a graft, this is why there's a risk of spinal cord problem or paraplegia with these operations. And the more aorta that we replace, the greater the risk. So this is the Crawford classification um, and extent to thoracoabdominal repair. You, as you can see, the second panel here, where we have to replace really the entire descending thoracic and abdominal aorta, while well, these are the most uh, risky operations in terms of uh, complications. And despite many improvements in surgical technique, these operations are still associated with a high risk of complications. Um, these are data from Dr. Caselli, one of my mentors, who has really the world's largest experience with thoracoabdominal aortic repair. And he published the risk of complications in over 3,000, over 3,300 patients who had this operation in Houston. And you can see, um, despite excellent uh, and excellent results, we still encounter risk of death of 8%, a spinal cord problem of 5%, kidney failure 6%, and stroke of 2%. And many techniques have been developed to reduce the risk of complications during these procedures. Um, but the bottom line is that these remain very complex procedures. These are just some uh, photos of uh, the different ways we've re reconstructed the thoracoabdominal aorta. But just to say that the results for this operation in particular are very volume dependent. Thoracoabdominal repair should be done in specialized centers by surgeons with specific expertise. Um, so one final comment about we do encounter often patients who have multi-segment aortic disease, meaning not just in the root or the ascending or in the arch, but a diffuse uh, enlargement of the aorta. And these uh, can be very challenging situations. Uh, requiring multiple interventions. This is a patient who had a sternotomy for a type A dissection, followed by a clamshell procedure for an arch uh, and the first part of the descending thoracic aorta, and then came to me for a thoracoabdominal repair with an, uh, you can see the incision for the thoracoabdominal um, uh, repair. And so we uh, do often need staged repair where multiple operations are needed to fix the problem. And so this is the typical way we reconstruct the aorta. Um, and I would say in the distal aorta, uh, as I said, we can sometimes use a frozen elephant trunk, um, but for patients who have genetic aortic disorders, um, branches, these uh, uh, were often asked, you know, can the thoracoabdominal aorta be replaced in a purely endovascular way with branches for the kidney and bowel vessels? And this is not a good idea for patients who have genetic aortic disorders. Those branches kink, they move, they break, they, uh, they're just not, uh, not yet uh, well designed enough uh, for our patients. Um, and so the surgical approach to the arch and thoracoabdominal aorta really must be tailored to each patient. So to summarize, I would say that aneurysms of the arch and thoracoabdominal aorta are really uh, quite rare in patients with genetic aortic disorders without a preceding aortic dissection. Um, all of our patients need lifelong CT and MRI imaging of the entire aorta. Echo alone is not sufficient. The size threshold for surgery really depends on many factors and has to be individualized uh, to each patient considering the risk of the procedure and the benefit to the patient. And repair of the arch and the thoracoabdominal aorta, the surgical approach must also be tailored to the patient. And the bottom line is that uh, you should really find uh, an aortic specialist who uh, focuses on aortic repair um, in, in these complex uh, situations. So thank you uh, very much for your attention. I'd be very happy to answer any questions you may have.
So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, that was very comprehensive. Um, before we start our questions and answers, I just want to let every know, everybody know we'd love your feedback on these sessions. Um, and you can use your app and uh, mark uh, the rate right there on the app. So we're going to start with some questions and I'm going to put on our videos. Um, but while I'm doing that, maybe the first question, uh, Morale, maybe you can uh, take that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and that question is, what is a pseudoaneurysm and what risk does it present? Let me just make sure that you're not on mute. Perfect. I, um, can you hear me, Joe? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So a pseudoaneurysm, um, which is also known as a false aneurysm, is typically, it's an aneurysm that doesn't involve the, in, the entire aortic wall circumferentially. So often it's at a site of a suture line or only involves one part of the aortic wall. Um, the, it does uh, pose a risk. Um, one of the issues is we don't have as good, because they're more rare, um, we don't have as good uh, data about the risk of these uh, pseudoaneurysms or false aneurysms. So one important thing to know is that, is it stable in size or is it growing? If there's a small pseudoaneurysm at a suture line after, after a surgery is done, um, but it stays stable for many years, we're not too worried about it. Um, but if there is a false aneurysm that's uh, quite substantial in size or growing, then it might have to be repaired and there is a rupture risk with, with those. Okay. Um... This one is a question about minimally evasive or less evasive surgery. Both of you hinted on that uh, in your uh, presentations. Uh, maybe Chris, do you want to take a uh, um, answer this question? Yeah, I think when people think about minimally invasive procedures, there's two things. Uh, the first thing is uh, T-bar or stent grafts, and Merrill talked about that just now. Uh, and that's a procedure for aneurysms. The other thing is TAVR procedure, which has uh, come up recently for aortic valve disease. Now, uh, neither of them have uh, advanced far enough to a point that we can treat Marfan patients with it. Uh, specifically, endografts for aneurysms in Marfan patients are notorious uh, for failures. So we, um, we do not do T-bars or endografts for aneurysms unless we really have to in emergency situations such as a type B aortic dissection and we want to save the life from rupture or malperfusion. Um, and for the TAVR procedure, um, the TAVR procedure, you have to remember, is approved only for aortic stenosis, which is a tight aortic valve. And that's the opposite problem that Marfan patients have. Marfan patients typically have a normal aortic valve or a leaky aortic valve. And the, the TAVR valve is not designed for these types of um, diseases. So neither options right now are good options. Uh, people have used them, but the results are not perfect. We still recommend surgery over endografts and TAVRs for most of Marfan patients. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, we have this question here about the Paris procedure and why don't we advocate for it in the United States and Canada? Maybe Chris, do you wanna take a, a, a um, answer that one? Yeah, the Paris procedure is a procedure that involves external support around the aortic um, aneurysm or aorta in the uh, ascending part. And uh, this is a procedure that was uh, devised by Tom Treasure in UK. And Tom Treasure, John Pepper, are, uh, from very reputable institutions in the UK. And um, we definitely applaud them for bringing forward this uh, application for um, patients with Marfan syndrome and aortic aneurysm. And in fact, uh, there's going to be a dedicated uh, s uh, session for this procedure. And I think, uh, Joe, you can uh, introduce that session um, to our viewers right now. 
That's, that is correct. We have a, uh, a, another session specifically on pairs with uh, Tal's Goldsworthy, uh, where he will review uh, the procedure and uh, we can uh, answer certain questions there. So let's go to the next question. These are two on mitral valve repair. Uh, Chris, can you answer uh, the mitral valve repair uh, types of questions? Right, so the question is with mitral valve regurgitation or MR, mitral regurgitation for short, what if we also have an erratic heartbeat? So uh, palpitations. Um, the two conditions combined remind me of mitral regurgitation with atrial fibrillation. And um, that tells me that the mitral regurgitation is advanced and the heart is suffering because of the leaky mitral valve. So the answer is yes, you should seek uh, help from the cardiologist or cardiac surgeon as soon as possible because this could represent a significant leakiness of the mitral valve, which can be very easily repaired uh, for Marfan patients. Okay. Um, so the, we had another question about the pseudoaneurysms. Uh, maybe Morale, you want to take this one uh, that was asked by Tina. Um, she says that she's had an aortic valve since 1990 and taking Coumadin since. Mm -hmm. Any advances in science retaking different medicine? Coumadin is just awful. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tina, for the question. It's a it's a important question. Um, unfortunately, well, it it really depends on the reason for why Coumadin is being taken. When it's being uh, taken for a mechanical valve, unfortunately, that is the only option we have right now. There are um, advances in science and other medications now that uh, can thin the blood um, uh, apart from Coumadin. However, when we have tried uh, to study them in the setting of mechanical valves, they're not adequate. They're, they're, they're just not good enough yet. And so uh, things like Noax, uh, Apixaban, Rivaroxaban, those types of medications, they can be used for atrial fibrillation or if you have a you know, biological valve and atrial fibrillation or another reason for a blood thinner. But for mechanical valves, unfortunately, we are stuck with Coumadin uh, for the time being. There are home INR monitoring machines that make um, Coumadin a little bit easier to manage. You can check your own INR at home. Um, but overall, it is, uh, it, it, is a, it is an issue for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe you want to take this one by uh, Monique, and she's asking about whether every patient on Marfan should be on Losartan, or does a beta blocker work just as well? Um, so medical therapy is uh, very important for uh, patients with hereditary aneurysms and hereditary aortopathy with aneurysms. Um, including Marfan syndrome. Uh, the trials did not show an advantage of Losartan compared to beta blockers. And in fact, beta blockers remain uh, first line for patients with Marfan syndrome. Um, people who don't have any aneurysms at all, we don't know if a beta blocker is indicated, but if you have a small aneurysm or it's growing, certainly in that patient, we advocate for a beta blocker to prevent the growth of, uh, of the aneurysm. And for, for my patients uh, after valve sparing route, we don't have um, randomized data or strong data, but I do like to keep my patients on a beta blocker to reduce the risk of a type B dissection after their root is fixed. Um, Chris, I don't know if the, that's your practice uh, as well. Yeah, that's exactly what we recommend as well. Okay. Um, so Chris, maybe you can take this one by Lynette. She's asking, what are the best repair options for an aortic aneurysm with bicuspid valve? How long is the recovery for these options? Yeah, I think this question is coming from maybe some patients who have bicuspid valve, not necessarily Marfan patients. And uh, the answer is 
bicuspid aortic valves, which are leak, leaky, should get repaired. And a lot of series, including ours, has shown that uh, durability is very similar to patients with non-bicuspid aortic valves, so three leaflet aortic valves. You have to remember that with the repair of the bicuspid aortic valve, the goal is to make a perfect bicuspid aortic valve. So the surgeon will not turn a bicuspid valve into a tri-leaflet aortic valve. The goal is to make it a perfect bicuspid aortic valve. Um, we hope that uh, with a good repair, we can get the patient hopefully out to the 60 years old. Um, there is concern at about 60 years old, the bicuspid aortic valve can get calcified. That's just the natural history of bicuspid aortic valve disease that they calcify in the sixth decade of life. But even if we're able to get a 20 year old all the way out to 60 years old with their native bicuspid aortic valve, we consider that a win for the patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe you want to take this one too. Uh, uh, Chris, are there any studies on Stickler syndrome and aortic insufficiency or uh, regurgitation? I don't know enough about Stickler syndrome to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Morale? Um, there, there are no studies on Stickler syndrome and aortic insufficiency. It's a um, collagen disorder, but um, I've seen nothing um, on aortic insufficiency and Stickler syndrome. It's quite rare, so there's, there isn't a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so here is one by Paula, uh, just asking about what exercise restrictions are advised for those with aortic dilatation. So Chris, do you want to see if you can answer that? Right, this is really important because um, the uh, strenuous exercise is what can produce the aortic dissection on top of the aortic aneurysm. Because when we exercise, typically blood pressure goes really, really high, especially when we're straining. So what um, our patients should do is avoid um, strenuous exercise as well as isometric activities. So it's okay to pursue um, light aerobic activities. So jogging, swimming, uh, bicycling, those are all okay. But to avoid strenuous things like running marathons, uh, playing um, um, high stress pickup basketball games. I know that's a disappointment to a lot of our young patients, but uh, those, are, those put, the, put our patients at risk for aortic dissection. Um, so in short, I think you have to avoid uh, competitive sports, contact sports, as well as strenuous uh, activities. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Morale, maybe you want to take this one by Yvonne. Is a yearly CT scan sufficient to rule out potential aneurysms or dissections? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, it really depends um, on the underlying, what the baseline status is. So if you just had an aortic dissection, for example, that was treated, uh, you had a type A dissection and you had emergency surgery, or you had a type B dissection that was treated with medical therapy, um, in the early, in the first year after that event, we do more frequent CT scans. So we may do them at, before you leave the hospital, at three months, six months, and then at a year to ensure that nothing is unstable or growing quickly. Um, but as long as things are fairly stable or you only have, you know, an, an, a small aneurysm that's not very close to threshold uh, surgical size, um, then yearly scan uh, should be enough. And it can be with either CT or MRI, um, but we should look at the entire, we should look at the entire aorta. If there's only aortic root pathology, so you only have, a, uh, you have Marfan syndrome and you have an aneurysm only in the root and the entire rest of the aorta is normal, you've never had a dissection, then you could alternate, you could have echo and then, you know, alternate with uh, CT or MRI every other year. That would be fine too. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And I just wanted to, sorry, I just wanted to add to Chris's comment about the exercise. I say the exact same thing that he did. And mm -hmm. one thing that's important uh, is that, you know, we want our patients to be healthy and active. So um, you, we want you to live, you know, full uh, lives and be healthy and active and not, uh, you know, be, be scared to go swimming or ride a bike and so on. Um, but it's that um, the 
competitive sports, the rapid deceleration, very strenuous exercise. And I always say, um, you know, if you're holding your breath and straining during the exercise or the maneuver, um, then it's really not good for your aorta. Your blood pressure inside can go as high as, you know, 300 in that moment. And we've all certainly seen dissections that happen uh, uh, because of that. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. Um, so it's almost time. Would you guys mind just staying a few more minutes to finish uh, uh, asking, answering a few more questions? Sure. Sure. Okay. okay. So this one is asked by Allison. In your experience, do you feel it is common to have a lot of fragile scar tissue when reoperating on connective tissue disorder patients and with an aortic valve replacement, how long would you anticipate a mechanical valve lasting if there was a lot of scar tissue? I think both of us can answer that one. Uh, very interestingly for Marfan patient, what I find is the reop is a lot easier than it is for reops for non-Marfan patients. I find that Marfan patients actually scar less than um, uh, non-Marfan patients. So um, the scar tissue really isn't that bad. And we've heard of stories of patients getting three, four, or five reoperations and do quite well. I think Bill, Bill described his experience and you know, we all, we all uh, have empathy and we, 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 feel, we feel for him as he talks about all of those operations that he had. But um, the reops are not that bad for connective tissue disorder in general. Uh, the tissue itself can be fragile. Um, um, when you get to patients like Lois Dietz or Ehlers Danlos, these uh, tissues can be extremely fragile and prone to the pseudo aneurysms that people were asking about earlier. Now for the aortic valve replacement with mechanical valve, we just uh, had a question earlier. Someone had a valve since 1990. That is a 30 year old valve. That's, that's probably a valve that we don't even use anymore. 30 year old valve is probably a single disc um, um, mechanical valve that we don't even, we can't even buy anymore off the shelf. So someone getting a new generation mechanical valve now um, can expect to have that valve for the rest of their life. And um, the newest valves we place right now are being uh, already approved for low dose, um, uh, low dose Coumadin with uh, lower range INR goals. So uh, technology has gotten better for mechanical valves um, with less, with a, with a lower dose uh, Coumadin, which is nice. Okay, great. So there's this question from Allison about how does valve resuspension hold up? Um, maybe she's talking about a valve sparing um, procedure. So oh, I, I think um, what the question might be getting at is um, suspension of the commissure. So aortic valve resuspension, which is most commonly done at the in the setting of a type A dissection, and mm -hmm. surgeons, uh, when you know when you have a patient who's there with a catastrophic type A dissection, where you know every hour there's a you know mortality risk and the the risk of the surgery is fairly high. Um, oftentimes, surgeons will want to do as little as possible, uh, that's as safe as possible to get the patient through the operation. So aortic valve resuspension leaves the sinuses intact. So the part of the aorta that's connected to the valve, it leaves the valve in place. Um, the coronary stay attached to the aorta. So that very beginning part of the aorta stays native. And then the commissures of the valve are resuspended and the graft sits above the, above the aortic valve commissures. So that is um, you know, very standard operation in the time of a type A dissection. And it certainly um, uh, you know, has a long history behind it. For patients with Marfan syndrome and Lois Dietz and other hereditary problems, Often the problem starts at the aortic annulus, so right at the aortic valve and the aortic sinuses. And so um, the aortic valve resuspension doesn't address that. And so this needs you know, close follow-up to see what happens to the, low, the very beginning part of the aortic root and the aortic valve. It can hold up if there's nothing wrong with the valve and the aorta in that segment is not dilated, um, well then it could be you know, fine 
for a while, but I would say for Marfan uh, patients, uh, usually it's the root that is uh, the part that's most often affected. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so after an, after an initial open heart bental uh, procedure, I continually have uh, BPM issues, pacemaker installed, and, and still surge is very high and low on a tenolol. Tricuspid valve still regurgitating. Is this something I should worry about? And does it cause more heart issues with the backflow? So I think the question is uh, for a leaky tricuspid valve. And we, we um, often see leaky tricuspid valves in patients who've had pacemakers installed because the pacemaker requires a lead that goes past the tricuspid valve and sometimes it can uh, prop the valve open causing the leaky tricuspid valve. Um, we, re we recommend treatment of a leaky tricuspid valve for a couple of reasons. If uh, one is if it causes uncontrollable swelling of the legs or belly. So sometimes people say that I can't put my pants on anymore. I got so much swelling in my abdomen and uh, we can't control it with diuretics, which is a medication we give to patients in order to get the fluid off. So that would be an indication to treat a leaky tricuspid uh, valve. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So this is a, a question asked by Douglas. Um, since aortic leaflets in Marfan patients can develop fenestrations, do you think an aortic root replacement with a bio root pig's aortic valve and sinuses of Valsalva, and a Dacron replacement of the ascending aorta and hemi-arch with coronary reimplantation is a good alternative to a David Vi-5 valve-sparing root replacement. Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. I would say um, what you want when, if you're having an elective root operation, you want to be with a surgeon who's an expert at valve sparing root surgery. Um, and you go to a center where, where these uh, surgeries are performed in high volume. The final decision of whether or not we save the valve at the time of a valve sparing operation depends on what the valve look lo looks like and it really depends on the judgment of your surgeon. So you have to trust your surgeon to make the right decision in that instance. In Marfan patients, depend the larger the aneurysm is, the more we see those little fenestrations. They often happen at the commissures, at the edges of the valve leaflets. And if there are only one or two small fenestrations, then that's not a problem. It usually doesn't cause leaking or affect uh, long-term durability. But if there are very large fenestrations that are taking up you know, the middle of the valve leaflet and so on, then that valve, if we think it's not going to be, uh, we're not going to get, you know, 10 and longer years of durability, then we would go for the alternative, um, which either a bio root or a mechanical uh, bental as discussed with the patient. And that valve choice uh, decision as the backup valve um, really depends on the patient's age primarily and then and patient preference. Okay, thank you. Um, this one is about gene variants, and for this one, I think there are many other sessions that talk about um, uh, genetics in Marfan, um, so maybe we can uh, look at that one in a different session. Um, this one is asked by Douglas, and it's about TAVAR. TAVAR can be used in patients after a bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement has been done and fails or becomes stenotic after years of wear and tear, which is why a mechanical AVR is being done in less middle, young middle-aged patients. Is this not your practice? Yeah, this is, and this is absolutely right. So Douglas is absolutely right that TAVAR can be done in failing bioprosthetic valves, even in the Marfan patients. And uh, this is in contrast to what I said earlier about doing TAVR in a uh, Marfan valve, which is not replaced yet. And uh, the observation is correct. The trend in the United States and across the world is to use more and more tissue valves rather than mechanical valves for patients, especially your patients who are middle-aged for this uh, particular reason that it can be treated later if it fails. Um, I don't think this, I still don't think this uh, should um, persuade our patients who are in their 20s or 30s to get a tissue valve because 
you're looking at maybe a five to 10 year uh, lifespan for a bioprosthetic valve when you're that young. And um, we have to remember, we can't keep putting TAVR within valves. Um, it sort of causes a Russian doll effect and we run out of space. We can't do TAVR into TAVR into TAVR. So that won't be an option for our patients who are young. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the younger you are, the less durable the biological valve is. And so if we put it in a 70 year old, we expect it to last your lifetime. And in a 60 year old, you might get a tissue valve and then one TAVR and that suffices. But the younger you are, as Chris said, if you're in your you know, 20s and 30s, even in your 40s, you're for sure facing another sternotomy where you have to take out the TAVR and the Bental, biological Bental and reconstruct the root. And we're learning more now that the TAVR explant operations are, are these are not low risk procedures. So it's a, it's a fine line. I think we would still recommend mechanical valves in the really young patients, but the age for biological valves certainly is going you know, lower and lower because of TAVR and the ability to at least once replace the failing biological valve with a less invasive procedure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and these are the last two, uh, two questions. Uh, I think I'll take the last one first, and it's asked by Michelle. Um, is a modified Ross procedure a valid surgical option for Marfan patients, in your opinion? Um, Chris? In my opinion, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. I would say no, it's, um, it's a, a contraindication in my mind, mostly because the um, connective tissue problems that we see also can affect the pulmonary valve. And if we move the pulmonary valve over, that autograph does fail in the future. Um, we, we don't do it in Toronto. Chris, um, do you, what do you think about Ross and Marfan? No, I do not offer I do not offer Ross procedures for our Marfan patients. I think the best the best patient for a Ross procedure is actually a patient young patient with aortic stenosis, which is not the problem that our Marfan patients have. Yeah. So um, I know some people are doing a protected Ross. I think that's what this person is asked by a modified Ross, where you put the autograft inside a Dacron graft. I think conceptually, I think that makes sense because it's protected but um, I would not offer a Ross procedure for Marfan. Mm -hmm. We see often in Marfan, you know, the aortic annulus is really stretched out. That's where the trouble begins, is right at the attachment of the aortic valve to the heart. And we know for Ross, Ross is very good when the annulus is really small, like 18, 19, 20. And then after about 26, 27 millimeters, it starts failing quickly. And in Marfan, we often have, you know, 30, 31, 32 millimeter uh, annulus sizes. So it's really kind of off the scale of what we think is durable in a Ross. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the last question is asked by Anne. Should patients, should Marfan patients have enhanced informed consent before heart procedures? Are we more at risk of bleeds or strokes? Chris? You know, for Marfan patients, I haven't found um, have increased, increased risk of bleeding or strokes. For our lowest DEETS patients, there's higher risk of strokes just because um, aneurysms can form anywhere, in particular cerebral aneurysms. So our lowest DEETS patients have a risk of, uh, of uh, bleeding strokes uh, mm -hmm. in the head. So, but we will look for that before the operation. So um, lowest DEETS patients, ehlers Danlos patients, we typically scan them from head to toe to look for aneurysms anywhere. But Marfan patients typically and um, we should ask our neurologists and neurosurgeons this, um, I don't think are at a higher risk for getting aneurysms in the brain. Mm -hmm. No, it's, yeah, it's not known. And I don't think in our experience and certainly in the literature, certainly for elective surgery, the risk of bleeding and stroke is not higher um, than someone who doesn't have Marfan. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you both for uh, really spending extra time to answer all of these questions and, and very comprehensively. Um, just some final thoughts. Um, if 
somebody's questions weren't answered, you can um, send them to marfan.org slash e3ask. Um, please remember to complete the session survey. Um, and we have uh, our exhibit hall, which is virtual, but please visit our exhibitors within the Hoover app. And if you want to connect with your community, um, you can do that within the app as well. Uh, if you're very active on social, um, you can use the hashtag E3Summit20. Um, and to help us make more pro programming possible, um, we would appreciate any donations to marfan.org slash donate. So thank you very much again for uh, both of your time, all three of your time uh, and effort here. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, and so does our membership. Thanks so much. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye.